already told them about you. <laughs> I heard. <laughs> I heard your voice yeah. through BBC. Yeah. Uh, you really use very, very kind words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that is a beautiful way to begin uh, this day. And I think all of us came here and received these wonderful tags this morning. And if we notice, it does not say VIP on here, but rather it says VSP. And that comes straight from this wonderful Archbishop of ours, that each person is a very special person. So remember that. And today we're very, very fortunate to have two of the world's most very special people. The world's, is it on now? Okay. Um, the world's uh, two greatest spiritual leaders. But the other thing that I see in both His Holiness the Dalai Lama and our Archbishop Tutu is a magnificent friendship that the two of them have formed. And their wonderful capacity to celebrate life and friendship. And while it is a real pity that His Holiness cannot be here in a chair sitting next to Archbishop Tutu to have this conversation this morning, we are so grateful for the world of technology that has come to us and that we can have this conversation. And so I'm going to open my questions this morning with a question on friendship. Um, and the friendship of these two very special people. Um, you come from very different cultural and religious backgrounds, and yet you found each other somehow and came together in this beautiful friendship. And I'd just like to know, and I think all of us would like to know, what is it that draws you to each other? Um, what do you recognize in each other? <laughs> younger, yes, let him speak first. <laughs> I think Elton. <laughs> I always respect you. So first you uh, you make comment. All right. <clears throat> I believe I have met one of, if not the, well, one of the holiest people in the world. Someone who has amazed me at the fact that he has been in exile over 50 years. And where you expected him to be bitter, and angry, he's actually a bundle of joy. I have sometimes got to tell him because he is, in fact, quite mischievous. <laughs> I, I have to warn him uh, sometimes and say, hey, 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 look here. <laughs> the 
cameras are on us, you, you need to try and behave like a holy man. <laughs> But as you, as you know, everywhere in the world where he goes, they have to find the largest venue because so many people want to hear him. And uh, I mean, once we went to Seattle, and the, the largest place was a football stadium. Over 60,000 people were waiting there, waiting for someone who actually can't even speak English properly. No, I am not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I really want to assure you, I'm not jealous. <laughs> but he just is a fantastic human being. And your holiness, we turn it over to you. <laughs> so, when I, when I meet people, first I consider the other just another human being. From my side also, whenever I met someone, I always feel I am another human being. So, the quality on that level, I consider the most important. Now, you, Archbishop Tutu, on that level, I think you yourself, completely free, you act as a human being. So, to that, on that level, we can develop genuine trust. On that basis, genuine friendship. So, you, Sometimes when you uh, describe me as mischievous, as you just mentioned, <laughs> I return you, you are also a mischievous person. <laughs> but then logically, two mischievous people, two mischievous persons automatically develop special uh, friendship. <laughs> then secondly, you, genuine religious believer, you always carry the true message of Jesus Christ. I consider you as a man of truth, man of honest. Uh, so that also one reason I develop respect and friendship. Then also, I think the time also one factor. I, I can't remember which year we first met, but since then, many occasions, we had opportunity meeting. Whenever we two together, the atmosphere literally changed, full of joys, full of sort of news, like that. So, uh, and then thirdly, you actually implement what you believe in critical period in your own country. Uh, the, the movement of reconciliation is really sort of the real sort of practical sort of service to a society where bitterness or distrust there. So these are reasons I develop respect and become a very close friend. Human friend, Christian friend. That is that's sort of my, my view. Those are beautiful views from both of you.
And one of the things that I observe uh, in your relationship to one another is a beautiful playfulness and an affection that comes uh, with this friendship. And I just wonder what you feel is the role of playfulness um, in a friendship, just briefly to follow up. Of course, naturally. Yeah, huh? problem. Yeah. So some, I say, the unnecessary difficulty. Essentially, our own creation. Many of them, our own creation. So, in such sort of circumstances, uh, laughter, sort of laughter, humor, then really creates calm atmosphere. The warm atmosphere. That's very important. With that kind of atmosphere, then discuss seriously which point we are facing. Other hand, the things are difficult to discuss. And on top of that, atmosphere also creates more difficulty. What use? After all, they also want happy life. Also, you see, I love smile. This side also loves smile. So then, better to create more friendly atmosphere and let know each other as human brothers, sisters. We both do not want suffering, do not want problem. So let us try to solve this social problem. That's my belief. Yes. I, I think, I mean, that uh, he, he makes holiness so attractive. <laughs> you know, he, um, there's, there's far too much, I think, solemnity. And I, I once saw a wonderful uh, picture uh, which, which was a picture of uh, Peter and, and two other disciples and, 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 and Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was laughing uproariously, throwing his head back, and, and the caption was, Jesus laughing at a joke Peter told. So frequently, actually, we, we think of our, I mean, like, I mean, of our Lord Jesus as a sour past. You know, yes, he was solemn because he, he saw so many ugly things. But can you imagine someone who was a sour past attracting children? I mean, he was very attractive to children because he exuded joy, a deep joy. And, and, and look at some of the stories he tells. He couldn't have told, I mean, the story of the guy who comes along and, and says, hey, hey, you, 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 look, 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 you, you have a splinter in your eye. And Jesus tells the story. <laughs> Hey, how can you see the splinter in this guy's eye when you've got a whole beam? I mean, the people must have been ro rolling in the aisles when he told that one. And he can't have been telling you. <laughs> I think he's very playful. He was playful and fun. Uh, and, and that was why he, he, he was so attractive. And maybe that is why he could cry. Um, today, um, we were going to have Your Holiness come to us and speak on peace and compassion as a catalyst for change. And since you are not here physically with us, we'd like to know what the kernel of that message would have been. What is the 
um, the core message that you would have brought to us here uh, at the University of the Western Cape in the very first Desmond Tutu International uh, Peace Lecture? I, uh, see, I am one of the nearly seven billion human beings. Uh, the future of humanity depends on our generation. Of course, future depends on present. So we have opportunity to create happier future or difficult future. Of course, major disaster, these are beyond our control. But all those usually I call man-made problems actually our own creation. Yet nobody wants Problems. No one wants problems. Uh, yet we created by ourselves some of the problems. So this ultimately, you see, here, not only in brain, but here, uh, more hatred, suspicion, distrust, jealousy, then creates this destructive activities, or destructive emotions. Uh, so, the first, uh, I mean, in order to change things for better, the first, uh, not only uh, sort of sufficient, sort of, what is it, the smart brain, but here we must uh, develop warm-heartedness, sense of concern of others' well-being. Just like myself, they also want happy life. So, that kind of motivation, sense of concern of others' well-being, once that motivation is there, then there is no room to want to develop desire, harm others, bully others, Cheating at that because you love that. So therefore, the change, better world, more peaceful world, more truthful world. First, sort of source must develop in individual heart. That's compassion, sense of concern of others' well-being. Uh, now here, I usually, you see. Uh, to follow two ways. One way to more compassion through religious belief. God is infinite love. God loves us. Uh, so we must and the entire humanity creature of God. So uh, to that kind of belief, respect other, love other. Then another way of approach, without talking religious belief, basic human nature. Now, according to some scientific sort of research, they find more compassionate heart. Your physical condition become better, more healthier, angry, anger, hatred, fear, suspicion, constantly keep here your physical need. So therefore, <laughs> practice of compassion is not only for the concern about next life, next to heaven, or some other thing, or from Buddhist viewpoint, salvation. Not only for these things, but day-to-day -day life. 
family level, community level, global level, the real precious thing within, within us is warm heartedness. So I usually you see, try to make clear, but people, the ultimate source of your own well-being, your own sort of uh, happy life is within your, your wisdom. So pay, take, pay more attention about this inner value. Is it, is it correct? Okay. <laughs> If you, if, if, you, if you agree these views, then don't call me mischievous. <laughs> your, your beautiful warm-heartedness certainly comes through in that, Your Holiness. Uh, every bit of that. And I would turn to you, Archbishop, for a moment and ask you now, um, there was a time when I was in war zones all over the world and I kept seeing people destroy one another and destroy villages and homes and communities. And I kept asking the question, how do we get upstream? How do we prevent wars from happening to begin with? How do we learn how to build a culture of peace? to promote a positive peace yeah. in our hearts and in our world. And how would you um, respond to that? It's actually very straightforward. <laughs> let, <laughs> let women over. That is actually seriously meant. It is to celebrate today the award of the Nobel Peace Prize to three women. It is to say Actually, thinking about Liberia just now, one of the reasons why the war stopped in Liberia was, was because the women of all faiths decided that they were going to pray the devil back hell <laughs> and basically they 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 told their men folk enough is enough um, I think I mean that biologically women are meant to be ah life givers you know uh, and i think that when women are truly feminine when they don't try to ape men that basically they they, they would say i can't carry a baby in my womb for nine months and then agree for that 
child to become cannon fodder. Um, you are biologically um, life-giving, life-affirming. That is, that is what you are naturally. What, that is what you are when you are unspoiled. And it's no, it's no, I, I think it's no, it's no mistake at all to have said the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I think Hitler turned out as he turned out because Hitler was not dandled by his Hitler did not get the sense of security that made him feel good about himself. And because he felt empty inside, he tried, as bullies tend to do, try to get the affirmation by being and nasty. And in a way, I, it is an appeal to, to, to women, to mothers. Come into your own. We Men are socialized into being macho, aggressive. Even if you, you actually are feeling insecure. And perhaps, as I've sometimes said, half jokingly, that of all of God's creatures, men are the most insecure. And we're very good actors. But I have found it about myself. I, I also facetiously, but really only maybe a third facetiously, I say, well, especially in the United States, I speak and then I get a standing ovation and I ought to feel good. I don't, until Leia says later on. <laughs> but I think what the, the Dalai Lama was saying about compassion That is what women naturally, I mean, sort of would normally be. We have a saying in one of our, our languages where they say, a mother can share even the eye of a fly. That women, because of this capacity to, to be caring, to be compassionate, to be life-affirming, can actually make society survive that are on the edge. Uh, and I'm quite willing to be a chaplain to that movement. <laughs> I think all we women
and the men folk in here too would give a grateful applause to the Archbishop for the thoughts that you just gave us on that and the and the um, the importance today of the uh, awarding to the three women of the Nobel Peace Prize this year. Yeah. I just wanted to say one more thing. The, the, His Holiness actually is very, very, very modest. Uh, and in some ways, I mean, when he says what he says with some uh, difficulty in the English language, he... <laughs> I still love you, don't worry, yes. <laughs> No, it is quite amazing the, the the work that they have done with people in MIT. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this whole thing where he was speaking about um, scientists uh, and doctors discovering. I mean that, uh, for instance, people who pray. It's been found that it has a positive influence on on your physical um, capacities, and and when you are unwell, they they have found. I mean, as they say scientifically, I don't know, but I mean, they say scientifically, they have found that those people tend to have a better chance of surviving and getting better, um, the, he's, he's, he's not said everything. He's, he, he, if I may so show, he, he is genuinely modest. Uh, but when he was saying that they have found, it's, it's that they have, they've, they've had, I mean, he spent some time um, at, at Harvard, where they they have been working on on the the impact of spirituality on 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 our well-being that uh, there is a positive scientific uh, evidence that it is not just a flowery thing i mean that the tutus of this world make you have to think it it actually does make you better uh, that when you are compassionate your blood pressure tends to be lower than the blood pressure of the person who is aggressive and angry and, and we know it i mean we have experienced it each in some way that uh, when you are angry you feel it in your tum tum you know uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I just wanted uh, people to be aware that. Uh, and are are you finding are you finding more and more that there is a strong hunger for a deepening of spirituality among the peoples of the world? I think yes. Your, yes. Wow. <laughs> See, quite a number of places. See, uh, different sort of what's the races. I notice now people they begin to feel limitation of material value because you see there are people who. Uh, very rich billionaire. Still, as a person, not happy. Unhappy person. Too much worry, too much anxiety, too much fear. So therefore, and and on top of that, as you mentioned, the scientifically. Uh, 
now for us the show very clear so was the finding that calm mind very good for our health uh, and the ultimate source of calm mind is open heart compassion heart so as an individual person become happier healthier and also their social relation uh, interaction with other people also improve uh, so uh, so you are right let me now scientifically you see uh, sort of agree the inner value is very very important now question is how to ever get that uh, may i say so uh, not uh, not like us religious person teaching not sufficient but through education system uh, this is basically of course all major education the essential practice is love compassion forgiveness uh, but itself not necessarily religious or sort of study it is something important useful for every human being even the ecology field warm heartedness sense of discipline sense of moral principle these are very very essential so the uh, through education we can educate people in kindergarten to the university level warm heartedness is for their own interest as much as important about this material value material value very important very good for our physical comfort but mental comfort these inner values are very very essential so i would like to add is something as my elder spiritual uh, brothers and also elder nobel laureate stated <laughs> i usually say tell you now this century 21st century should be century of dialogue century of peace uh, in order to create peaceful century it does not mean no longer any problem any sort of potential potential of conflict problem there so we must find ways and means to solve this problem to peaceful means that is dialogue so we must develop this century should be century of dialogue previous century different century of violence so now here the biologically as you rightly mentioned female more sensitivity about other pain now some scientists also is mentioned when two person one male one female observing one person so sort of painful experiences uh, and the response from two person the female much stronger response because biologically more sensitive sensitivity about other pain so therefore now this century in order to be peaceful century uh, we must promote the value of compassion love for that now female should take more active role regarding promotion of human compassion human affection so so please you the moderate moderator as a female you should take more active role now we now we need to
now ready to take more rest. You already now retired. Uh, I also now retired from political leadership. So now, uh, and I really very much missing you since you retired. Now, few occasions, some Nobel or meeting, but you are not there. So I always feel something, something missing. So this time, I really, very well visit there, see you, and some exchange of some mischievous word. <laughs> <laughs> but okay now, uh, now this I really very much enjoy. You see, although physically long distance, uh, but I can see your face. Uh, so, uh, so I really feel very, very happy. I want to be asked him one question. Go ahead and ask. My dear brother, I, I know uh, that we we belong in a mutual admiration society. Uh, but I was I I just wanted to find out from you. I mean you may have many secrets. <laughs> <coughs> Do you have an army? Spiritual. Spiritual level? Yes, I have army. <laughs> Not weapon. Yeah. But wisdom. And compassion. I, I was asking this question only to find out why does the Chinese government fear you? <laughs> it's quite simple. It's quite simple. Some Chinese officials describe me as a demon. So naturally, some fear about this demon. <laughs> when, when I first time heard, you see, that kind of Chinese officials comment, uh, I I feel laughing. So I immediately respond, yes, I have home. Demon home. <laughs> I, I think the I think the, in the reality uh, the communist uh, totalitarian system and not only communist but many totalitarian system hypocrisy telling lie is unfortunately become part of their life. So you see someone who tell truth honestly, truthfully, transparently. If those people who carry hypocritic sort of way of life then feel uncomfortable. So like you, uh, uh, me also. Is it trying to make clear what's the reality? And also now in the bad case, I often tell you 1.3 billion Chinese people should have every right to know the reality. Then 1.3 billion Chinese people also have the ability to judge what is right, what is wrong. So therefore, censorship is immoral. Let 
no reality. So, uh, uh, and then another thing, the people sort of China, their sort of judiciary system, still very, very low, becomes sort of the parties or what's the instrument. So the Chinese judici judiciary system must raise up to international sort of law standard. That's, I think, very, very important. So I'm uh, often, you should tell you, when I met some Chinese friends, some professors, some artists, some students, I always tell them, people from China, most of populated nation and China have sort of great potential to serve, to, to take a sort of constructive role on this planet. For that, trust from the rest of the world is very, very necessary. Respect, trust from the rest of the world is very necessary. For that reason, transparency is very essential. So, you also, I think many people listen to you, trust you, so speak these points. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank, Thank you. you. It, it seems like um, when you were asking the question and you were responding, some of that, um, that mischievousness and that playfulness came through, but there was a real seriousness in what you were saying and the transparency and the trust that is so important um, that we bring in trying to resolve so many of the crucial issues that we have in our world today. And I think, too, of the Arab Spring, uh, for example, and the role of youth that, that they have played um, in this um, Arab Spring. And the way in which um, it started out more for um, the citizens, for example, of Libya, and now seems to be more of a fight for the resources of that country. Um, how do we turn some of that around and really create that kind of environment of compassion and a, and a kind of environment of accountability in those who govern and in the international bodies like the United Nations? Um, and how do we instill um, in the youth, the generation to, that is coming forward now, um, these visions and values that you two so beautifully portray in your life and, um, and want to pass on to them? No, You're you too. have more experience, and particularly the northern Africa is part of Africa. So you see someone from South Africa, you see, gives some ideas, some suggestions. I think very worthwhile. I'm very far away. <laughs> yes, yes. I was going to say... I was going to say that's cheating, but uh, I I don't think that we I will I will apply it to you today. Uh, you are quite right. Uh, I have constantly been amazed when I meet people, and I I mean I I've been uh, on this uh, semester at C. Leigh and I have been on this now uh, twice, going right around the world. And I am constantly bowled over by the incredible idealism of the young people. Uh, they go anywhere where they see poverty, 
uh, they want to change that. And, and I think, I mean, that we, we ought to be saying to them, go ahead and, and dream, and dream. I mean, part of what is happening, for instance, in Egypt is, is that um, they toppled the one regime, but some of the power structures of that regime remain. I mean, the army is probably not uh, uh, one that has been reformed. Um, and the young people and, and the others are saying, no, this is not the kind of freedom we wanted. Uh, we, want, we want a freedom where those who govern are accountable. And, and I have a lot of time, I have a lot of faith in, in, in young people, and I always say to them, please do not allow yourselves to be infected by the cynicism of oldies like us. Um, dream, and, <clears throat> and, 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 and they are inspired by people like Bono, like Geldof and others, that poverty can be history. It is, it is, it is, it is possible for us one day to get it into our numb skulls that it is far better to invest the resources that we have, not in budgets of destruction and death, billions, when we can have a very minute fraction making sure that children everywhere have clean water to drink, have enough food to eat, have, I mean, have a good life. And I, I believe that we, we letting them down and we in the faith communities ought to be saying to people, do you know God created us for family. We belong together. We are sisters and brothers, not as a figure of speech, but really. And after all, we all began in one place, Africa. We are all Africans. <laughs> I have one thing, uh, one thing to say. Uh, those North African sort of states now recently, uh, it's a big change. So now, I think, the, as a people's sort of peaceful movement, finally, big change uh, take place. Now, oh. Uh, I think uh, from I think you you can show them the spirit of reconciliation. I think that's very important. At the recent months, violence, you see, naturally, you see, develop some sort of uh, uh, difficult feelings, you know, some anger, some hatred some sorrow. So, your spirit and uh, your work uh, show them reconcil reconciliation is highly necessary. Then, more sort of genuine unity built their nation uh, uh, to achieve what they are dreaming. Their dreams only materialize through their work, not just word. So, in order to carry unified work with full of enthusiasm, reconciliation is something very essential. 
So that, I think, my elder brother, I think, have plenty of experience to teach them, to sort of, to suggest them. This is one thing. Then, uh, these, uh, these years, recently, I also, you see, mentioning the corruption. Almost like new disease, new cancer of the whole world, whole planet. So, so, uh, so you and I myself also, you see, got the, you see, the Nobel Peace Prize. Peace means non-violence. Now here, the corruption, corrupt act, also kind of violence. The violence, not only just physical sort of, sort of, because of that, cheating, but cheating, unjustly take advantage, and these corruptions are also serious violence. So when we talk about non-violence, about promotion of every society, I think please you also should mention, should touch the uh, corruptions. I think that is very important, especially those sort of, uh, developing nations like China, India, and some other. Uh, the amount of money which come through corruption, if this money spent on the welfare of poorer section of people, it yeah. can be some significant. So I, know, I think in, <laughs> in your continent, Africa, also I heard from distance plenty of corruption. <laughs> <laughs> So that I think I think we we have some now I think special sort of responsibility to remind them. And then, as a religious believer, I I usually be telling my my some my friends who believe God. So then there is only 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 two choice: either believe God. And act truthful, honest. Or another denying God and corruption. <laughs> oh, it is impossible. Pray to God, worship to God, but don't care about God's message. And you fully carry, I mean, you carry corruption. It is a big contradiction. If you really want to be a corrupted person, then don't pray to God. <laughs> so I otherwise you see, pray to God. Almost something like cheating God. I pray to you, but I don't listen. I, I'm not listening to yours or teaching. It's cheating God. So therefore, I think I also, you see, I was a religious person. So I often see telling people, if you really believe religion, really believe Buddha, really believe God, you must implement God's message, Buddha's message. So, so this I I want to uh, to share with you. What do you think? <laughs> I think you've done beautifully. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank I you. Think that, I think that we could go on all day long with these two very special friends talking with one another, but I know that we need to come to a close here. But, Your Holiness, I would like to ask you one more thing. If you were going to give a gift from your heart to your very special 80-year-old friend here on his birthday, 
What is that gift that you would give to him? Firstly, as a religious sort of believer, Buddhist, I offer you sort of all my sort of the virtues through my own practice, dedicate for your life, for your health. So the other day I mentioned you as a man of truth, man of God, please live long. I am looking for your, your 19th uh, birthday. I'm looking forward. <laughs> At that time, don't forget, send me invitation. <laughs> Then we can test test your government. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. I think it's one to one to go Thank <laughs> you. 
Then you'll have to follow me, and if Mamela is ready, I will take. I will take you out. 